Hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we have one more program in our series, and that will be on Tuesday. Uh, Felix Perez Fulch will be giving my mom's favorite stamp, the 150th anniversary of Mississippi. If you've attended Felix's talks before, you know that you will learn and you will laugh. Uh, he always does some unexpected things and we have a lot of fun. So go to the ATA website and register for that one if you haven't already done so. And that's this coming Tuesday, March 23rd. With the last of the series coming up here, I'd like to remind those of you that have been joining us uh, throughout our series, uh, but yet have not yet joined ATA, we'd love to have you do that. We do incur some expenses to, view, to give these programs. Uh, Zoom does cost us money to use. And so uh, if you join, you not only would benefit from all the benefits of ATA membership, including our wonderful journal, Topical Time, but you would also be helping finance these Zoom programs and we plan to have many more. So uh, do please think about that. Go to the ATA website. It's easy to join, or if you prefer, make a donation. You can do that there too. Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, and again, thank you all for joining us today uh, for Carol Edholm's presentation on The Bird That Cries Help. Uh, Carol's a lifelong stamp collector who enjoys both uh, country and topical collections. She's been extensively involved in youth philately and more recently has been um, concentrating on uh, researching, collecting and exhibiting PFAL. Uh, Carol's uh, also the president of the Seattle Philatelic Exhibition, CPEX, which is a annual uh, World Series of Philately show. Um, she has been awarded the APS Care Future of Philately Award in 2009 and has also received the uh, Notorious Achievement Award from the Northwest Federation of Stamp Clubs. And with that, uh, I'd like to welcome Carol. And Carol, if you could please unmute. Thank you, Jeff. Okay. Uh, for my first screen, I would like everyone to raise the volume on your computers so you can hear uh, the first slide. <clears throat> Um, okay, got to get that out of the way. Slideshow from the beginning. <laughs> wow, have you ever heard such a sound? This is the call that many people unfamiliar with the bird thinks it is, call, is someone calling for help and they call the police. What kind of bird makes that sound? Is it the yellow-bellied tragopan? How about the Cuban golden pheasant? The gray peacock pheasant? Not as colorful, but look at that tail. Well, at least these birds are in the same avian family as the actual crier. Here's our plan of what we will be going through today. The Phasian Day family, aka pheasant family, consists of game and ornamental birds, such as turkeys, chickens, pheasants, quail, grouse, partridges, and the guinea fowl. Our help crier is the pavel or peafowl, most commonly called peacock. To clarify, peacocks are the males, peahens are the females, and pea chicks are the offspring. Peafowl is the family name, the proper term, and addressing the birds as a whole. There are only three species of peafowl. Let's look at them. The India blue is the most popular of the peafowl species due to its brilliant blue neck, colorful train, and easygoing nature. 
They are native to the deciduous tropical rainforests and mountains of India and Sri Lanka. They can handle colder temperatures than the other two peafowl species. The Java green peafowl is not quite as popular as the blues, but many breeders do have them. They originate in the forest and lowlands of South and Southeast Asia, from Myanmar, Burma, to Java, Indonesia. The Congo peafowl were not discovered until 1936 by Dr. James P. Chapin of the New York Zoological Society. The Congos are native to the rainforest of the Congo Basin in Central Zaire, also known as the Democratic Republic of Congo, and previously before that, Belgium, Congo. Let's take a look at how the Congo peafowl were discovered. <clears throat> Dr. James Chapin was the foremost authority on the birds at the New York Zoological Society at that time. He traveled to the Belgian Congo in the early 1900s on an African expedition. There he noticed some unusual bird feathers in a chieftain's headdress in the Congo Ituri forest region. He and other Western scientists had never seen these types of feathers before. The natives called the bird Imbulu. Dr. Chapin frequently returned to the Belgian Congo over the next 20 years in an effort to find the bird, but did not find any more samples or see the bird itself. In 1934, Dr. Chapin saw two stuffed birds with these old or the odd Congo feathers in the Belgium Congo Museum in Tuveron, Belgium. The museum called the birds Indian peacocks. Chapin discovered that they were actually the Mbulu. Finally, in 1936, he located some of the Mbulu in the Sankura district of central Congo and brought back seven specimens. In reality, these birds were a true African pheasant, the only one in all of Africa. They are a distant relative of the Asian peafowl. The discovery of the Congo peafowl was the biggest bird news of the century. This current souvenir sheet shows what the Belgium Congo Museum, now known as the Royal Museum of Central Africa, looks like today. In 1949, Mr. Charles Cordier brought to New York from the Congo some live specimens for the zoological park. There has been much research into this little known bird. Some peafowl experts claim that it is not a third species of the pavo. Others say it is. And the research that I've done, I believe the latter. I think the, Con the African Congo birds are actual a third species of peafowl. Sometimes you will see a white peacock or hen. They are not a species, but a hybrid of the India blue. There are over 225 hybrids and mutation colors recognized by the United Peafowl Association. Argus pheasants and green pheasant members are not aphasian, they are members of a Phasian Day family, but they are not peafowl. Many people confuse them as a peafowl due to their tails. Besides their native lands, there are some other differences between the India blues and the Java greens. Of course, their color. The blues have bright blue, almost purple necks. They have a white area around the eyes. The greens have much less blue, more green with yellow blue, uh, yellow below the eyes. All peafowl have a feathered crest on top of their heads. The blue's crest is shaped like a fan. The green's like a tuft of feathers sticking up. You can see my cursor. Here's the fan for the blues. And there's the tuft of, like a tuft of grass sticking up. Both the blues and greens have common colorful trains. These trains are shed late summer, early fall and grow back in for the spring mating season. It is Charles Darwin's theory that the peacock strutting around with the most full and colorful train will be chosen by the peahen first for mating. Notice the peahens do not have trains. Peacocks are a little over eight feet long with trains an additional eight feet long, if not longer. 
they weigh around 12 pounds. Peahens are smaller. In the wild, peafowl live to about 20 years old, 30 years in captivity with the proper care. The Congo peafowl are somewhat different than the blues and greens. They are much smaller, about the size of a standard chicken, but they are about twice as heavy than the blues and greens. The Congo peafowl do have the feathered crest on their head, but they do not have the colorful long train. Their body feathers are short, or their body feathers and the short tail do have an iridescent shine like the other two pavels. And then notice the peahens here. Uh, one here in the middle and then one here down at the bottom. A group of peafowl is called a muster or bevy. Peacocks usually have a harem of two to five peahens. The peacocks claim a spot of territory or land that is called a lek. The birds roost in tall trees to keep safe from predators. Roosting in tall trees help the peacocks train to stay undamaged and gorgeous and allow them to preen the feathers when wet. Peahens lay a clutch of three to six eggs at a time in ground nests. The hens sit on the eggs until they're hatched. Once the chicks are a couple of weeks old, they are able to fly up into the lower tree branches to roost with the adults for safety. I have never found peafowl eggs or chicks on philatelic material, but these pheasant eggs come close. All peafowl eat pretty much the same food, fruits and berries, seeds, grains, flowers, and other small plants, and grubs, small critters like mice and baby snakes. Peafowl have played an important role in world history, culture, religion, politics, and art, and are still important in today's societies. So let's take a look at some of these. Once upon a time, India was ruled by Maharajas, royals. This specimen sheet shows the royal crest of India at that time, with one depicting peafowl. Notice the peafowl at the base of the bust here of George VI, and the train of the peacock goes all the way around him. Burma Independence Army used a peacock overprint in conjunction with Japanese occupational officials. There are several varieties of these, as well as many counterfeits. The British Royal Navy had a ship called HMS Peacock. The U.S. Navy had four ships called USS Peacock. None of these ships had onboard cancels, and I'm still doing research on the HMS and USS Peacocks. Government postal agencies had no problems issuing items depicting peafowl, from cancellations to aerograms to this Christmas bird's booklet cover. This is the cover of Composers of Polyphonic Music. Peafowl are revered in India, Myanmar, and China for their beauty and ideas of prosperity. They are often seen in palaces, temples, parks, public grounds, and on the land of wealthy estate holders. The UN stamp on the right shows peafowl at Schoenbrunn Palace, Vienna, Austria. Peafowl have also played a big role in mythology and religious beliefs. Peafowl are popular with the gods. Similar caches such as this one can be found on many India postal stationery pieces. They are, uh, peafowl are on both sides of the menorah on the top stamp. Bottom strip shows peacock mosaic from a 6th century synagogue. Did you know that peafowl are a sign of fertility? Peafowl have been the subject in all types of art for thousands of years. Statues, cloison teapot, and this Poland was on peacock porcelain vase. Then there's dishes and platters representing peacocks. Then you have printed and other art, art forms from paintings to book covers. The peacock is behind the lion on the stamps in the top booklet. 
Romance of the Mysterious Peacock from the Cordell Talk uh, Folk Tales Souvenir Sheet. The single stamp is of a peacock pair on an Albanian codex, 11th century. Children often paint peacocks in artwork. These stamps were both done in contests from the respective countries, Taiwan and Poland. Popular peafowl paintings. The Taiwanese stamp set was printed for the Taipei 2008 exhibition. For those of you who do needle arts, perhaps you've seen some with peafowl. But needle arts has been around for just about as long as many religious and mythologic, mythologic, mythologic beliefs. Peafowl are a favorite in lace making, embroidery, and tapestry. I myself have over a dozen peafowl cross stitch projects to work on. Only three are completed. Hungarian embroidered pillow cover on this Azerbaijan stamp and a peacock embroidered rug in a set of Pakistan handicapped handicraft stamps. I fell in love with these when I saw them. It's royal Thai silk with foil applications on these sheets. This is actually silk threads embedded in the stamps and sheets with gold. So there's your gold foil on the peacock and the blue foil. Love these. The Senegal stamp shows a stylized peacock in transmission of thought tapestry by Os Osman Fay. I received the souvenir sheet from my India contact last year. Peacock feathers are popular in clothing. The king of Bhutan has a peacock hat. C. Ryan is a turn of the 20th century artist for comic, children, glamour, and nursery depictions. Look at that dress. And the eyes of the peacocks that is all over this dress, those are called ocelis. Peacock feathers in family crests. Peacock fan from Macau. There are various peacock dances from around the world. Carnival King with the gold peacock headdress for Trinidad Carnival. The Indonesian stamp depicts another type of carnival with another style of peacock headdress. These are very heavy headpieces. A peacock mosaic from Rotunda Capula in Thessalonica, European cultural capital. The 1974 cover shows a stamp of a peacock window on a public building in Nepal. There are also open air pantomime theaters with peacock curtains. This is in Tivoli Gardens, Copenhagen, Denmark. I just did an article on these two particular, uh, the postcards and the stamp for the United Peafowl Association Journal. It was quite interesting learning about this. Kites, who doesn't love kites? Now the center kite may look like a phoenix, but China claims it is a peacock. Peacocks are well known in various types of advertising, from advertising postcards to matching labels and chocolate card inserts. From soap wrappers to orange crate labor, labels, fruit stickers, and phone cards. Vintage jam label on booklet cover, the peacocks up here at the top. For all you stargazers out there, there are several peacock constellations at least 150 light years away. Here is one of those constellations. Are the birds endangered? There are no worries about the India blues becoming threatened or endangered. The Java greens are a threatened species in their natural habitat. They are more difficult to domesticate than the blues and have the worst temperament. 
In their native lands, they are hunted for food and their feathers. They are poisoned as pests to crops and suffer loss of habitat. They cannot handle cooler weather like the India Blues. About 10 to 20,000 adults were last reported in the wild in 2018. They are now mostly seen in aviaries and breeders. Many breeders through the United Peafowl Association do have the uh, Java greens as well as the blues and the many mutations and hybrids. The biggest danger to the Congo peafowl is man, farmers and logging of the rainforest. The African natives have trapped the bird to near extinction. extinction. There are not, they are not often seen in the wild with the last count of about 2,500 to 9,000 adults in 2013. The Congos are difficult to domesticate, though there has been a little success in zoo breeding. There are breeding programs at Belgium Antwerp Zoo and at Salonga National Park, Democrat Republic of Congo or Zaire. The birds must be kept in indoor aviaries under strict temperature control. None are privately owned. This is a nice 1963 Imperf mini sheep that was issued to bring the world's attention to the status of the Congo peafowl. These are some of the predators that affect all three peafowl species in their native habitats. Weasel type critters, wild cats, and of course, man. Up until the past two to 300 years, peafowl were a delicacy at royal banquets, weddings, and other VIP dinners in Russia, Romania, and other European countries. Some countries today still enjoy peafowl as a dish, but India has forbidden the hunting and killing of peafowl today. They are India's national bird and thus protected. Snakes are a danger to all peafowl. They eat the eggs and young chicks before they can fly into the trees for safety. Lures monkeys are deadly to peafowl. They drop onto them at night while the birds are sleeping and start eating through the top of their heads for their brains. This item is from the salvage of a sheet of non-peafowl related stamps. In order for India to take care of their indigenous peafowl, back in the mid 1950s, they instituted a Mandy tax. It's a non-governmental private revenue stamp, which paid for the shelters, feed bins, and feed to care for the local area peafowl. If you are not able to travel to see peafowl in the native regions, they are most often found in zoos, aviaries, breeders, and farms. Our local zoo has only one peacock as they are too noisy and messy. The Greater Vancouver Zoo in Aldergrove, British Columbia, Canada has several males, but no hens or chicks. What does your local zoo have? Of course, the India Blues will never become extinct due to breeders. The India Blue is the base for many hybrids and mutation colors. Flannery O'Connor, a controversial writer in her time, owned a variety of fowl, including peafowl, from childhood up until her death in 1964. Her family for farm has since been preserved with a variety of phasian day, including peafowl, kept on the property. Now, if you enjoy exhibiting, over-inking and under-inking items are possible philatelic elements. Some philatelists call these printer's errors, others say printer's waste. Either way, the printer should have destroyed them. But they made their way into the market with which works for my peafowl exhibit, as long as these predators are, no, are noted on the page as printer's errors or printer's waste. So notice that these postal cards are tigers, which is a predator for all the peafowl. If you're going to exhibit, make sure you have cancellations and meters related to your topic. Lastly, a good advertising postcard or cover is always a bonus. This is just a light review of how India peafowl, how important peafowl are in today's world history and still to many cultures around the world. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you, Carol. That was great. That was awesome.